Hi, I'm Carlotta Berry, and I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Rose Holman Institute of Technology. I am also part of a team of faculty in electrical and computer engineering, computer science and software engineering, and mechanical engineering to start the first ever multidisciplinary minor at Rose Holman in robotics, obviously. And I am co-director of Rosebud, which is the Rose Building Undergraduate Diversity Program. It is a professional development, networking, and scholarship program to encourage more women and minoritized and marginalized students in STEM to pursue degrees in electrical and computer engineering, computer science, and software engineering. I am also co-founder of Black in Engineering with Dr. Monica Cox at The Ohio State University and Dr. Tahira Reed Smith at Purdue University. And I am on the organizing committee for Black in Robotics. And today I'm going to talk to you about Black in Robotics, why diversity matters. So first I would like to share a little bit about myself and my intersectionality as a professor, an engineer, and as a Black woman. So Ernest Boyer states that the work of the professoriate may be separated into four separate yet also overlapping functions. Scholarship of discovery, integration, application, and teaching. He proposes that there must be a more inclusive view of scholarship where these four dynamically interact to make an interdependent whole. And I like to use this to define myself as an academic. So what this means is that knowledge is acquired through research, synthesis, practice, and teaching. And we have scholarship of discovery, which is investigative research, which is what most people are familiar with as well as scholarship of integration, which is the synthesis to make connections across disciplines, which robotics is ideal for. We have scholarship of application, which is applying the synthesis and investigative research to consequential problems as well as service, which robotics is also ideal for. And then, because I'm also an academic, scholarship of teaching, which is where we educate and entice future scholars to transmit transform and extend knowledge. So I like to say that I bring robotics and STEM to people and I bring people to robotics and STEM to educate and diversify the profession. And part of me as this intersectional academic with these four foundational building blocks, I'm able to do this. And I like to call it, I am a nouveau STEMist or a nowhere STEMist which is another way of viewing myself as a professor because I'm not just an engineer, but I'm also an academic who does lots of service using robotics in order to recruit more populations to STEM and bring it to them as well in order to change the face of engineering and market it to a more diverse population. And as part of doing this work, I teach, which is what this left image is showing is my freshman engineering design course where we use robotics to teach them the engineering design process. And on the right, I use robotics to do research with my undergraduate and graduate students. And I also use robotics to teach some of my upper level courses for the students who are in the multidisciplinary minor. And there are also courses in artificial intelligence, computer vision, image processing, kinematics, dynamics, etc. And then down the center, I use robotics as part of my service. At the top is my daughter's gamer girls robotics team. It's all girls. They're all Girl Scouts and they do VEX and first Lego league. And then the middle shows that I was a first robotics competition judge, judge advisor. And I was also chair for two years for the Crossroads Regional, which is the award that I got for volunteer of the year for that. And I also do robotics workshops for middle school and high school students. Here is Twist Summer Camp, which I did at St. Mary of the Woods. So as part of breaking the mold, what I challenge people to do is that if you do a search for engineer or professor on Google, or if you're looking for gifts on social media, typically what'll come up is either younger or older white males. And they may normally have glasses, maybe tape on their glasses, a pocket protector, you may get an image of Dilbert or Sheldon, but I like to say part of changing the face of engineering is understanding that engineering is defined to be when we 
find solutions to problems to impact the world and make it a better place. And since the world is becoming more global and diverse, engineers need to reflect the world that we live in in order to come up with the best solutions. So here is what ideally engineers should look like. Hashtag, I look like an engineer. Isis Winger in the top left was a software engineer in the Bay Area who coined this hashtag after she participated in her company's marketing campaign. And when posters of her were posted on the Bay Area Rapid Transit, a lot of people started contacting the company and saying they knew she wasn't really an engineer and she was really a model. And why was she dressed like that? Why was her hair combed like that? Why does she have that snarky look on her face? And she came up with the hashtag, I do look like an engineer because I am an engineer. And it started this viral campaign of people posting images of what they did and how they really are an engineer. And to me, this is my vision for what we have to make engineering into in order to make that discipline reflect the world that we live in. So I don't want this to be an ad campaign for Goldie Blocks, but I wanna show this video because this is an example of an ad that got it right. is a device that is made up of hardware and electronics that uses software to give it some level of artificial intelligence and autonomy so that it can achieve a task or goal in the world. So robotics is ideal for multidisciplinary work in STEM. So this is why I teach multidisciplinary robotics and why it's also ideal for diversifying the STEM academy because mobile robotics is inherently multidisciplinary. So it already draws students from computer science, electrical, computer mechanical, biomedical engineering, math, physics, as well as several other disciplines. There are so many benefits in multidisciplinary work, including teaching students to speak the language of their classmates' discipline while also being the expert or domain expert in their certain field in their depth knowledge. There are some unique challenges with multidisciplinary robotics, however, including divergent interests, divergent, divergent prerequisites, and hardware and programming ability. But that's also the richness of multidisciplinary robotics because they have to learn from each other. So the way that we like to represent this at rose Holman is we have a mechanical system and mechanical and biomedical engineers may be the most versed on the mechanics of the system. Then we have software in a robot, which is the computer scientists and the software engineers wheelhouse. And then the electronics, which may be more ideally suited for the electro electrical engineers and computer engineers. They take classes in all of these departments during their four years so that they learn to work on teams with people with different majors. And then they come together because we have a multidisciplinary senior design project. 
And the cool thing about it is computer science and software engineers now get some hardware familiarity, such as understanding what are kinematics, what are controls, etc. Electrical and computer engineers and mechanical engineers may become more well-versed in software development. And mechanical engineers may learn more about embedded system, microcontrollers, and sensors. So now I want you to show, an show you an example of how I also use robotics in my freshman engineering design class, as they have to design a robot system to complete some kind of design challenge, which they then are able to demonstrate during the final competition. Welcome to the Monster Mash. So the competitions are not necessarily for a grade. They're graded on their ability to execute the design process, not to actually win a competition, but it is a great way for them to get bragging rights and for them to see that in engineering, they are able to do things that are fun while also being impactful. So my area of research is actually human robot interaction. Human robot interaction is the field of study to understand design, and evaluate robotic systems for use by or with humans. The objective is to develop principles to allow for natural and effective communication between humans and robots so that they're able to achieve some tasks. So this is why diversity in robotics is so important because humans are innately ingrained in the process of robotics. So the model that you can use in order to create these robotic systems is based upon artificial intelligence. So this image here is called a sensory egosphere and it was part of my PhD work. And it's a way of representing the ego of a robot in the middle around its sphere. If you wanna think about it like a sphere of influence in this case, being sensors, peripherals, and things that impact the robot's space. So based upon this, this sphere, it could be seen as a database that is also searchable and it could have IR data, sonar data, odometry data, exact, et cetera. So it creates an internal model of the world that the robot can use for planning and reasoning, a way to represent its knowledge, to solve problems, or to search for things. So in this case, it could search for, I'm looking for a yellow cone, and I'm confirmed it's there based upon my sensor and sonar data, and I need to somehow plan a path to that area. Or it could be keeping a database of how many balls are in the area, how many cones are in the area, how many obstacles are within my space? So here is an example of my students representing some of their robots knowledge in a human robot interface in order to teach the robot to do localization and mapping and path planning. Perfect. Okay, so this is localization. Um, so for the map of the world, we've translated it to our cell numbers. So we are starting um, in 3, 2, and we're going to find out where we are once we end in 0, 2. In our sense, this is 11 and 8. Um, what you're going to see over here as the robot's moving is this is going to say this is where we think we are. Um, and then once it settles into one location where it knows it is, it's going to update our GUI with graphics. Let's start here. So we now think we're either we were in three or eleven. You can see the numbers at the bottom. We now think we're either in one, two, nine, or ten. Same thing. We finish in and zero boom. two. We are currently right there, and that is where we started. So that was an example of a team with a computer engineer and a mechanical engineer on it who designed a user interface and they could do this in their MATLAB, processing, Java. I give them the flexibility to use whatever knowledge they have in order to achieve the um, assignments in the mobile robotics course because at that point they're seniors and so they all have their foundational knowledge. So here 
we talk about how does bias get injected into artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics. And it basically happens because when humans work on these systems, they sometimes can inject their prejudices or their inequities with respect to class, race, gender, socioeconomic status, etc. So these are some of the things that bias can be based on. Here we have Charles Isbell, who does research in artificial intelligence. And just recently this happened where there was a algorithm in Twitter that if you uploaded a highly pixelated image, it would try to correct it for you and it would always default to a white male. And it had done this with a, pre a picture of President Obama as well as some others. And this is how we learned that this algorithm was biased towards white men. So some ways to address this bias is to have more multidisciplinary and multicultural teams so that you can actually try these systems on more than just a few sample data to see when these things happen. There are other examples as well. Here's one that I show my freshman students when we talk about why diversity on teams and multidisciplinary teams matter. And this video is, I think, from around 2011. And it shows a soap dispenser that actually was designed with an IR sensor, which do not always react well to darker colors or darker skin. And therefore, it only worked on lighter skin. Mm. Nice. Okay, Noel, we try it Come to your honey. Two black or two black? Yeah. So what I'll come do again? Uh, Olua, Olua. Come again, Sash. No, you nah, need to back over me. What I'll do to get to yeah, get to yeah, get yeah. 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 What do you have to do? That's how racial this thing is. Yeah. Put I have to use that piece of white. Let's see how that thing. I'll show you. That's what you're doing. Bring your pin again. Napkin again. Right, bring your what hand. Is hand it? What's it called in your hand? <laughs> man, the black man getting fight black man get fight all over, all over, all over. During my first semester at MIT, I got computer vision software that was supposed to track my face. It didn't work until I put on this white mask. I'm thinking, all right, what's going on here? Is it the lighting conditions? Is it the angle at which I'm looking at the camera? Or is there something more? That's when I started looking into issues of bias that can creep into technology. Our ideas about technology that we think are normal are actually ideas that come from a very small and homogeneous group of people. Vast amounts of data at incredible speeds. Everybody has unconscious biases, and people embed their own biases into technology. This kid got stopped as a result of facial recognition misidentification. And then used that as justification to search you. This is an innocent child. Racism is becoming mechanized. Systemic issues are only going to be hardwired into new technologies. It's not just face classification, it's any data centric technology. Every day we are all being scored. Who gets hired? Who gets housing? I am making predictions for your life right now. The people who own the code deploy it on other people, and there is no accountability. Management at Atlantic Towers wanted to install the facial recognition software. Pretty much turned this place into Fort Knox. The technology is being rapidly adopted, and there are no safeguards. We are socially controlled in a way that we don't see. technology that analyzes faces could be biased, but the company is pushing it anyway. What demographic is it most effective on? White men. Show me that it's going to be fair, that it's legal, before you put it out. That's what we don't have yet. It's going to take people coming together, striving for justice in this age of automation.
So one of the challenges when you have bias in AI, machine learning, and robotics is it can lead to injustice. When you have bias that's based on protected characteristics, it leads to decisions that negatively impact a protected group, and that leads to injustice. This can be intentional or unintentional. For example, if it's intentional, there may be awareness of bias, and if you're acting on it, you're hurting marginalized groups. Or if it's unintentional, it could be implicit bias, but the actions are based on biased assumptions and it could still hurt marginalized groups. So how do we address bias and injustice in others and in ourselves? So here's an example where Robert Williams in Detroit, Michigan was arrested because an AI algorithm did a facial recognition check on driver's licenses to match them with this dark blurry image from a robbery at a store and it came back as a match on his driver's license and he was arrested in front of his wife and children completely based upon this failed facial recognition or algorithm. So how does bias find its way into robotics? Well, you have assumptions and model priors and in information accessibility. So you have to look at what assumptions are being made about the end user, the environment, uses of technology by end users that may affect other groups. And then how much data do you have? Are you, how much training data are you using? How diverse is that training data? If there is AI, what data is used to train the models? Is this information representing the true population, including marginalized groups and protected characteristics considered? Should they be explicitly taken into account? Should they be actively filtered out? And is the operation robust enough to protect characteristics? How do you recognize these cases when bias is found, has found its way into robotics? You have to look for services or actions of robotic systems that negatively impact a group based on protected characteristics, such as with the arrest of Robert Williams. How do you address bias in robotics may, that may lead to injustice? You have to have better engineering, better policy and usage, and you also have to have more diverse teams who are present and looking for these things. So bias can be coded into a system so that machine learning and artificial intelligence can perpetuate inequities such as gender, race, ethnicity, social, economic, class, or sexual orientation. So examples of this are that Microsoft's Tay was an AI teenage chatbot that learned from interactions on the internet within 24 hours of being exposed to the public. Tay became racist, sexist, homophobic, and had to be taken down indefinitely. And this is an example of how bias can be injected into our AI or machine learning. Apple Health Kit, which enables specialized tracking such as selenium and copper intake, neglected to include a woman's period until iOS 9. Here's another example of where researchers did not consider women in the design process. Similarly, this happened when um, crash test dummies were first created to be the average male figure, and it was many years later that they discovered that the ratings for several cars were low in safety with respect to women, pregnant women, and children, because no one had thought to make crash test dummies in various sizes to consider that. There was another example when Google's computer vision system was labeling African Americans as gorillas, while we noticed here that the Microsoft's vision system was not able to recognize darker skinned people, similar to the soap dispenser that did not recognize darker skinned people due to the sensors that were used. There have also been examples where voice recognition systems could not recognize a female voice, only male voices. So all of this is to say that you have to have diverse teams to create safer products. Another study conducted by Lancaster University concluded that Google search engine created an echo chamber for negative stereotypes regarding race, ethnicity, and gender. For example, if you typed in the words, are women into Google, it would auto-complete with choices such as a minority, evil, allowed in combat, or last but not least, attracted to money. So how do we solve these problems? 
Well, there has to be better engineering and better policies. And this is where organizations like Black in Robotics and Black in Engineering come in. Black in Robotics was created to address system inequities in the robotics community by focusing on community, accountability, and advocacy. So it includes networking, mentorship, social media presence, showcasing and normalizing black excellence in robotics, connecting academia and industry to diverse talent, supporting and defending equity and performance and ethical use, being a conduit for all roboticists to participate in solutions, identifying best practices and holding each other accountable for equitable designs. So strategies for addressing bias and injustice in robotics, developers must consider ethical implications of robotics usage. Educators must include ethics and societal questions in training. Teams must be diverse to provide unique perspectives and solutions. And researchers must reference the work of diverse roboticists. Here are examples of two diverse roboticists here, Jeremy Delane Brown and Ebony LA, who are both on social media showing their work in engineering and robotics in order to normalize seeing diversity in robotics and finding these people to put them on your team to help address inequities. The next steps for the robotics community are to actively promote diversity in developing teams in academia and industry, ensure that bias is considered in the research and application of robotic systems, and make bias training and its effect in robotic applications and methods of mitigating harm a component of the educational curriculum. Here we have another black roboticist, Aaron Shepard, who not only works at NASA, but also does a lot of outreach work as well as social media demonstrations of robots that he builds. Black in Engineering is also doing work in this area. It was created to make engineering environments where we are respected and treated equitably through messaging, policy, education, and awareness, a social media campaign, a call to action, Black in Computing also has a call to action that you can go and read, share, and sign, community engagement, connect with allies, strategic planning, and finance. So I wanted to end my talk today by showing the video that Black in Engineering released in July of 2020 after the killing of George Floyd, after the racial pro profiling of Christian Cooper, the bird watcher in Central Park, and after the hashtag Black in the Ivory started, started trending on Twitter to um, address some of the challenges that Black academics and particularly Black faculty in STEM endure. I'm black with a PhD, but I still could have died by a knee. I am George Floyd. I've succeeded using my head, but I still could have been shot in bed. I am Breonna Taylor. I think teaching and learning is fun, but I could get killed while out on the run. I am Ahmaud Aubrey. I'm a hidden figure in STEM who puts my hood on. Like, like Trayvon. And can't be stopped, like Sandra Bland. All racism, I do condemn. I engineer like Imhotep, but my black skin I can't sidestep. I can't breathe. I'm Eric Garner. This is not a game. I'm Tamir Rice. What if I'm next? Then it's hashtag Denise R. Simmons. If it's hashtag Leroy Long, I am Laquan McDonald, I am Ayanna Stanley Jones, I am Walter Scott. I am Katherine Johnson, Philando Castile, Alberta Spruill, and Samuel DeBose. We, we will not, not be silenced. silenced. It is our turn to have a set. So on behalf of the STEM community, this is what black STEM faculty like us have to say. It says PhD outside of our office doors, but we still get mistaken for janitors. And we love our custodians. There's no hierarchy when it comes to black labor. They allowed us to get where we are. Say something back to speak up and speak out. Then we get blacklisted or just get kicked out. 
love to teach, only to get called bad names. Names they wouldn't own if you called them out. Love to do research. But it's only safe if we sell out. Don't research black or shout. shout. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Black lives matter. 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 Now rise up. I'll rise like the day. So I welcome questions on anything um, in my presentation or things not in my presentation. So I wanted to give you some ways that you could connect with me. My email is barry123 at rosehoman.edu. Although I am on sabbatical right now and I have been since March, 2020 when the pandemic started, but I will be back on campus in August, 2021. Or you can connect with me on Twitter or Instagram at D-R-C-A-B-E-R-R-Y. And my website is bit.ly Barry Webb, or you can connect with Black and Robotics at blackandrobotics.org or on Twitter or Insta Instagram at Black and Robotics, or connect with Black and Engineering at blackandengineering.org or on Twitter or Instagram at Black and Engineering. And I will tell you that we do have outreach through Black and Robotics and Black and Engineering, and we have been holding virtual robotics workshops, and there are some virtual MATLAB workshops in the making as well. So if you connect with us on social media, we can um, connect you with some of those, and we would like to thank our sponsors, which are Amazon, Hattabot, Open Robotics, as well as a lot of allies and advocates in the community who donate to our work. Thank you for listening.